Revolting News Presents A Stolen Life In Memoriam Francis Frank Olson Killed by Police Sensitive topic that affects us all. We're going to talk about the police in the community and uh, what some of the problems are living in our society today, a gun society, a society of violence, a society of violence on uh, wherever we go, including violence by the government, official, official violence, violence by the armies that are on our side that kill all the bad people on the other side, and cops that, uh, police that kill all the bad people. Uh, I'm not here particularly to uh, attack uh, every member of the police department. Uh, the police department kills uh, a number of people every year all over this country at, in a very high in a, at, uh, a very high rate considered with other countries, but police officers also get killed, they have families and so on. We're going to try and discuss the problem without establishing our main, our main issue is not to establish guilt, but to find a way to make things better. Uh, our, our main speaker today is a woman who's had a tragedy in her family. Her living companion of many years was shot to death on, on the streets of Manhattan. In what year? 1990 by uh, officers that we, the citizens, paid, I think, in an unreasonable manner. Uh, she's going to tell you her story now. And then we'll discuss the implications of it. Yeah. Well, I belong to a group called the Stolen Lives Project. This is their first book. There are 500 stories in this book of people who have had family members shot to death by police. This is the first edition of the Stolen Lives Project book. A second one will be coming out, which has 2,000 people shot to death by police since 1990. I'm going to tell you my story, which is just one story in this book. Um, uh, on October 22nd, uh, this group will be marching to City Hall. And if you want to join us, you can get your pencils and papers, and later we'll tell you how to get to the march. Okay, I'm going to tell you my story, um, which is published in this issue of Street News. Street News uh, is a paper that's put out, sold by the homeless, among other people, and uh, the cover says, No More Homeless Deaths. Uh, the man I'm going to tell you about, unfortunately, was a psychiatric patient who ran away from care and decided to live on the street rather than in the... S than, uh, uh, with the people that the psychiatrist had appointed to take care of, of him. Uh, he wasn't able to survive very long and was soon killed by the police. This is the story of Francis. Um, one way to dispose of yourself that Dr. Kevorkian hasn't thought of yet is to get in a serious fight with a New York City cop, preferably with a lethal weapon in hand. If you don't have one, don't worry. The officer may be happy to let you have one of his extras, but most likely after he's blown your head off. Then others may find it in one of your limp hands. This method is entirely foolproof. Well-meaning friends and relatives won't have your stomach pumped. Self-righteous clergy and shrinks won't insist that you live. Of course, the cop will have to face a grand jury hearing the next day, but all he has to do is produce a small wound and maybe supply an eyewitness, even one two blocks away, to the fact that someone tried to kill him, and the cop will be found innocent due to self-defense. Uh, something like this happened to a friend of mine, a lover, my most significant other for 20 years, who happened to be burdened with progressively worsening schizophrenia and the awful fate of going in and out of mental institutions. This is a patented formula for a tortured life, and he didn't particularly want to live. As a matter of fact, even heavily medicated, he used to shout, I want to die, over and over in the halls of the mental hospital. The other patients would say, shut up already, you're being a pest. 
Um, they won't you let you die in here, he, he complained of Manhattan Psychiatric, which was the main reason he wanted to get out. Though technically a mental hospital is not supposed to release someone who announces suicidal intent, uh, he considered it a danger to himself, they released him anyway in July 1990, relegating him to an adult group home in Queens. Three months after his release, his paranoia, dissociation, and severe depression returned as it had so many times in the past. The social workers from the home wanted to rehospitalize him. He didn't want to go, so he ran away without medication and hit the streets of New York City, especially around my place on the Upper East Side. He visited me and it was sort of cool. Then he asked if he could stay with me. I couldn't handle it. Shutting the door on him, I expected he'd hang around the street until he wound up in the hospital again, as he had before. Phone calls came in from friends that he had visited and tried to stay with. He was in terrible shape, wandering around lobbies, ringing doorbells. No one could take him in. Crisis intervention team? There wasn't any. I called the doctor at the hospital. Sorry, they were no longer responsible for him. Called the adult home. They couldn't do anything. They didn't even realize he was gone. When he stopped ringing the doorbell, I assume he found his way to a hospital. But he didn't contact me as he usually did, asking me to visit, bring cigarettes, food, instant coffee, and money. Instead, a detective from the missing person squad wanted to know if I knew where he was and when was the last time I saw him. The adult home had reported him missing to the police after collecting the social security money that was due him on the first of the month. For several weeks, a very sick man had gone without care and medication, and there was not even an attempt to find him. Five and a half months later, mid-March, the police, quote, found him. They must have known his name for a long time because it had a, quote, attempted murder charge after it as he lay semi-comatose and quadriplegic in Bellevue Prison Ward with five bullet holes in his face and legs. I was not informed of his whereabouts until it was about time to identify the body, that is, until he slipped into a fatal coma and couldn't speak to give his account of what happened. It was then, when he was transferred from prison ward to trauma ward, that all the charges against him were dropped. What I saw was like an Auschwitz victim, barely skin-covered bones in fetal position, open stores like stigmata. I have a picture here to show. Uh, here. Barely skin-covered bones in fetal position, open sores like stigmata, a bandage over staring fixed eyes, life support tubes, an IV tracheotomy, a respirator, breathing for him. Doctors kicked the bottom of the bed and he twitched like a decorticated frog. No brain waves, they said, but would not discuss his medical case with me because I was not a legal relative. His records were classified high security risk and could not be obtained. That meant they feared a lawsuit. He died a few weeks later. Poor relatives in San Francisco and the Midwest were unable to take legal action. I was told it wasn't my lawsuit because I wasn't legally related. Civil liberties, patient rights groups, FAMI, Friends of the Mentally Ill, NAMI, National Association for the Mentally Ill, Consular Kubi, and lawyers for Eleanor Bumper's case were all consulted but nothing came of these consultations but further referrals and demands for money. Forget it. Nevertheless, curious, I went back to, uh, over my tracks to find out what happened six months ago. I found the microfilms of Newsday and the Daily News the day after he was shot on October 17, 1990. Both had small pieces with headlines, deranged homeless man is shot, cops slashed on Upper East Side, officer stabbed, suspect is shot. Newsday was the paper that carried the story of an eyewitness report from a man in a candy store two blocks away from the shooting. I saw the man jump at the cop with a knife, blah, blah, blah. To me, the same man, a young, dark-skinned Indian, maybe in his 20, confided, we've got to clean up the streets. He said that he saw the man standing near a lamppost holding a knife, holding it, not threatening anybody. The press used the words brandishing and menacing. The police were there to handle a holdup that just happened, and they couldn't catch the bandits, so somebody directed the cops to him. He ran two blocks, most likely fearing he was about to be hospitalized. 
He was already in a very out-of-it paranoid state when two plainclothes cops tackled him. He must have reflexly fought back, but what chance did he have? Was this what they called attempted murder? And what about the law that cops are supposed to use lasers or stun guns on the emotionally disturbed? That fell by the wayside, too. I went into the stores on the block asking if anyone remembered what happened six months ago on First Avenue between 72nd and 74th that Indian summer day. Not many people wanted to talk to me. They were nervous. They didn't want to get involved. Go away. I'm busy. Can't you see I'm working? Employees of Woolworths and Sloan's told me. It seemed that blue-collar workers were less likely to freeze me off than white collars. Most people gave me back the story that was in the paper. Such was the power of the press. He had a knife. He cut the cop. The cop blew his head off. No one saw him stab the cop. A West Indian checkout woman at Sloan's, who actually worked near the front window, said she actually saw the cops kill the man. Why? Because he was hassling people. Did she see the knife? What knife? She replied. I asked if she'd say that in court, but she wouldn't answer, looking up and around and refusing to speak to me any further. So the cover-up was complete. Neighbors were saying he was better off dead. Civilian Complaint Review Board? I should take the cops out to dinner, someone suggested. Actually, the complaint was filed, but it was just brushed off. So his death wish was fulfilled by the New York City Police. Who was he before he was sick? He was an aspiring poet and playwright, a 60s cultural and political revolution. Mary? He held an MFA in Fine Arts from San Francisco State, seminary trained in Catholicism, attended Esalen, Joan Baez's Nonviolent Institute. He lived at the Chelsea Hotel and was sometimes seen in the company of interesting and accomplished filmmakers, poets, musicians, and playwrights. In the early 60s, he marched against racism in Selma, where he was shot at for the first time. A Vietnam War resistor, he eluded the draft by voluntary admission to a mental hospital. I guess the best role for me to play in this society is that of a madman, he said. He acted the part of a psychiatric patient in a film by Lloyd Kaufman. He refused the role of leader in an insane asylum revolt in a major motion pictures company production because it involved violence and murder against his principles. Francis was occasionally on something like a Christ level and able to bring through what seemed like miracles. He was like a whole shelf of Russian novels or a Gorgifian remarkable man before he fell. Francis was influenced by the works of Thomas Merton, Alan Watts, and many of the wise men from the East who came to talk to Americans in the 60s. He believed that aliens had contacted him long before others were talking about it. He was six foot tall, tall and so weird that you could walk through Central Park with him late at night and the other psychos would hide behind bushes. But Francis was so gentle that he wouldn't displace a cat on a chair. He launched roaches out the window instead of killing them. Replayed, re, repaid good for evil, turned the other cheek the whole bit. Distur discharged patients would come back to the mental hospital just to visit him. In the early days in the village, he was often led in places for free and greeted with a big cheery hug. The night before he was shot, the thrift shop turned up copy of Reich's Murder of Christ, and a quote from it was, and the insane who are in touch with Christ will be chained for life all in the name of Christ. Each year around his memorial time, Woolworths puts out copious lilies and Easter blooms for sale near, near the spot where he bled. I couldn't resist placing a handwritten plaque on the nearby lamppost that read, In memory of Francis, mental but gentle, shot here by cops. Died April 17, 1991. But sanitation or someone tore it down. Since there is no name above the marker in Hearts Island's Potter Field where he's buried, if you think he deserves a memorial, I guess this is it. Okay, so Francis is listed in his Stolen Lives book. His picture is there. Last year, uh, October 22nd, I marched with this poster of his picture. Oh, no, no, this is the poster of his picture, uh, which was... Uh, um, the story was published by Donald Lev in the Home Planet M News, and uh, it says, Homeless Poet Shot by Police, 
and there's Francis's picture. And what I wrote here is police murder doesn't cure mental illness. Okay? So the point of this activist group is to end police shootings. And uh, Yeah, I want to sort of uh, put uh, some of these things in a larger context, if I might. Uh, the United States is a country that has uh, over 200 million guns. Some of them are in the hands of police. I guess that's not counting the army. Maybe it's not counting the police. Uh, that's almost one gun for everybody in the country. Uh, other countries seem to be able to get along without that. For instance, uh, in Great Britain, the police don't carry guns. They have guns in the station house, and they can get them if they find someone who's uh, who's carrying a gun they can get them but uh, but uh, there are the, the United States leads the industrial nations in the number of people in the, in the percentage of people killed by guns and the percentage of children killed by guns the US uh, the next closest uh, nation is uh, 12 this 12 10 or 12 times less than in the US so um, we're a country addicted to uh, violence and to guns. Now there are also uh, people who have guns who aren't the police who use them in uh, terrible ways. Um, these are people who are poor, minorities. Uh, a relative of mine was uh, mugged by a. a member a black person and they started to speak about these people well it isn't these people because uh, as far as I know very few black physicians go out uh, she was mugged and beaten this woman uh, very few physicians go out after office hours to mug people so there are basic problems in this country that aren't being addressed uh, questions of poverty, questions of uh, broken family structures, questions of education, questions of the distribution of power. Um, we're not going to solve this problem uh, mechanically, but uh, if there were no, when when the, when a maniac in Scotland uh, shot about twenty children to death in the schoolyard. Britain further restricted the laws. Uh, he was a member of a gun club, so he, he had a right to own a gun. By now, it's almost impossible for a private citizen to uh, own a gun in England. When something similar happened in Australia, they enacted incredible uh, anti-gun laws. Uh, but this country seems to be able to uh, want to avoid any kind of uh, gun control whatsoever. Now the police are recruited from, the police have not existed uh, into eternity. Police forces were established in England on a regular basis in the 1830s. Frankly, they're mostly there to protect the property of the rich. And uh, it was very cleverly, they were given services that were needed, like rescue services and helping people. A friend of mine who was who grew up in a middle class in another country was told that the uh, the police were the people who uh, got found your dog when your dog was lost. Well, they do that, but they also do other things. It helps in your contact with the police that you be dressed very well and that uh, I want to tell a story, uh, personal story. Back in the 60s, I was in, uh, walking along Bleecker Street, and these two, a black person had fallen in the street. He looked like a homeless person. He was drunk. He started to bleed from his uh, scalp. He was with another friend. They were both drunk. I, I called the police to get an ambulance, and uh, I stayed around because I wanted to, I wanted to see uh, when they would come. They, a, a squad car came and they jumped out and one cop pointed to the guy on the street and first he asked who called the police and I said I did 
And then he said, uh, he points to the, he asked the guy on lying in the gutter who was bleeding, uh, who, who hit you? Did he hit you? And he pointed at me, and the guy goes, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, he hit me. So I, I, uh, I had this very flash uh, vision. I, they take this guy to Bellevue, he dies, and I've been accused of murdering him. But the, the, nothing like that happened. An ambulance came and they took care of him. But what the cop was telling me was, if you had the nerve to call us for this black scum, I'm quoting, this is what I think was on the mind of the cop, uh, we're going to teach you a lesson. So uh, they taught me a lesson. They taught me never to hang around and never to identify myself when I call the police. And only call the police if it's, an, if it's a... Um, a question of life and death. Now, where do the police come from? They come from the working class. Uh, so, uh, anarchists and wobblies have analyzed this and socialists as uh, getting the working class to keep, getting some members of the working class to keep the rest of the members of the working class under control. The cops and uh, the National Guard are always called out as the last resort in strikes and civil dis disturbances. So, the army the army is uh, the, the citizens of the state in the last analysis have to uh, uh, be afraid of their own army because it's not there to protect the interests of the uh, lower classes it's there to protect the interests of the ruling classes as far as getting justice whatever that is um, an Italian anarchist Malatesta said organized vengeance called justice so um, we have a deeper problem than just uh, uh, psychically retraining uh, the police uh, although that's well worth doing there should be more there should be more women although women can be just as uh, uh, ruthless as men some women but in general, I think uh, mm -mm. they're kinder than men. Mm -hmm. Don't you? Yeah, the, uh, and I'm, we I'm want a street warm, vendor. Not? I'm a street vendor, and the only one who ever walked up to me and said, "Are you sure you're dressed warmly enough?" It was a woman cop. And there should be <laughs> more members of uh, minorities, although members of minorities can also be uh, try to prove that they're. Uh, just as good and strict as the others. So this is a uh, problem that's not really basically soluble, solvable by halfway measures. So I want to encourage all of you to work hard for uh, social change in the country. And uh, it's it works both ways. Uh, cops get killed too. Cops all get right. shot. Uh, although I think the proportions are like five to one of uh, five dead civilians for uh, one dead cop. Uh, so, um, I don't know how, how this these problems are going to be solved uh, if we don't solve the larger social problems that create people who are unhappy well, and I commit think, I crimes. Think, you know, uh, me, uh, uh, a lot of things are called crimes that I don't really consider to be crimes. Uh, uh, taking things a rich person steals from, uh, he becomes rich by stealing the labor of very many people. No one becomes a, uh, a billionaire like uh, Bill Gates is on the way by his work of his own hands and mind. He has uh, uh, literally hundreds of thousands of millions of people working, producing uh, ideas that he takes and machinery that he takes and uh, technology that he takes. So uh, we face basic problems in trying to solve, but meanwhile we should try to do whatever we can, I think, to uh, have uh, Excuse me, better Julie. police. The, the, the words are almost contradictory. Right. Yeah, this activist group wants justice for all the family members of the victims, and they're working with lawyers to get justice. And the, the chant as they march is no justice, no peace. It's not an abstract matter of or well locking up uh, locking up yeah, criminals doesn't solve uh, then then yeah, well mo most half of the people locked up in this country have violated drug laws so uh, are we going to lock up people I don't believe in prisons 
know, let, let's even be more radical. Uh, bad a psychiatrist can be, I, I, I prefer some kind of psychiatry to prisons. You know. As a matter of fact, uh, your friend might have been better off with psychiatrists than with oh, He had 15 system. years of psychiatry. All right. And uh, uh, they just messed up his mind even further. All right, that can happen. You know, I know yeah. that happens. But uh, you yourself told me you thought he, he would have been better off in an institution. But... Uh, uh, not uh, people. Uh, people were thrown out of the institutions and left to themselves. Yeah, that's right. Because I think there's, on, there's money enough for a two billion dollar bomber, but not enough money to help people who come out of mental hospitals. You know, out of sight, out of mind. The homeless disappear from Manhattan, except you see them now. They're not in conspicuous places. They're hiding. They're pushed out of the way. Well, I think they were dis de deinstitutionalized because. Uh, there were civil rights lawsuits that were brought against the mental hospitals that these patients' civil rights were being violated. And uh, also these drugs were invented which were supposed to keep them cool. But uh, oh, many people didn't want to take... Yeah. To it is much cheaper. Yeah, and also they don't want to be there. Well, I, I used to ask the patients, where would you rather be, in lock up here, or would you rather be out living on the street? Yeah, well, I would rather be uh, on the street, A hundred percent of them said they'd uh, rather be living on there, the street. But there, there, are, there are things that are in between. There are good halfway houses. Yeah, there's, there are, there's not adequate there, care for the mental health. There's adequate, uh, you can, uh, there's, not a, there's not adequate housing. Uh, uh, why couldn't a uh, mental patient have his own uh, apartment? Well, he couldn't take care of it. There are degrees of mental illness, but very, very severely ill people right. like Francis could not have right. taken so care of his own So it's a complicated problem, and That's the right. resources aren't there because they're going to pay high salaries for the governors, and uh, the uh, uh, the people have to make huge profits on the stock markets. But shooting to people to death on the street is not the answer. No, we I don't agree think, on that. No, I don't it, think if someone that. is sick, if someone is disabled, if someone is in desperate straits, and homeless and and with no money and with no food and no place to go do right. we shoot him to death in the street no all right give the uh... for more information contact the october 22nd coalition stolen lives project info at october 22nd.org Thank <laughs> you.